All right, children, Sunday school, have fun. Okay, so how is it that some Sundays we have like 17 kids and other Sundays we have four? This makes it, this makes it very difficult for Sunday school teachers to plan, but it's an adventure, right? It's an adventure every Sunday, right, Griffin and Gibson? Uh-huh. Awesome. What they said. Um, now, uh, okay, took offering. Da, da, da. Okay, I think I got everything. Let's, um, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for the abundance of goodness and grace that you've poured into our lives. And we come this morning asking for more because you, you tell us that you're a good father who delights in giving good gifts to his children. And, and so we come to ask for, for the things we need, for the things that will ultimately be best for us. Lord, there, there are those this morning in need of wisdom and guidance, your hand of providence for the days and weeks and months ahead as, as they're facing new chapters in life. There, there are those who are sick or in need of healing. There are those who... Um, who need a sense of your peace and shalom to, to enter into their hearts and minds because worry and fear is, is gripping them right now. Lord, I, I don't know the needs of every person who walked through this door this morning, but I know we all have them because I know, I know our brokenness and it's, it's all over the place. And so we, we come this morning to bring our petitions before you now. Would you hear them for Christ's sake? Now, Lord, we, I, I ask for help because I know every time I open your word and reflect on it and meditate upon it, um, Lord, there, there are things in it that change my way of thinking. There, there are ways in which you, you call me um, to live differently. And, and I, I know I need your help in delivering and communicating that well. And I suspect that the hearers of this morning's message need your help as well. Uh, so Lord, if, um, w- would you just, do you filter what I say? Lord, if, if, if there, you know what everyone needs to hear this morning from your word, would, would you be faithful um, to your promise that your word won't return void, even as I preach this morning? May the words of our, my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. We pray. Amen. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, if, if you don't, didn't bring your Bible with you, uh, we encourage you to bring it. If you don't have one, let me know. We'll take care of that. Uh, if you don't have one right now, I'm not going to take care of that now, um, but in, there's a pew Bible in front of you, and Isaiah is going to be on page 490 of your pew Bible. If you don't know your way around your Bible, Isaiah is just a little bit past the middle of it. It's a pretty big book. It's going to be hard to miss. And we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 9 in, in, in just a moment. I was, I was reminded this morning and this weekend of how, how evident the brokenness of the world in which we live in is. It, it, it doesn't take, you don't have to watch a lot of newscasts. You don't have to go through a lot of Facebook feeds to see the brokenness of the world in which we live in. And, and it seems, even though we constantly put our hopes in new laws and new regimes and new presidents and new senators, the brokenness still seems to permeate and continue the world in which we live in. And, and the reason that is, is, is because 
We're broken people and the people we elect or the people who govern us are broken as well. Sin has infected all of this world. And, and even though, I mean, could you pick a more beautiful place to worship this morning? Even though we can walk out here and see the mountains and feel like we're above the fray and be surrounded by beautiful grass and uh, beautiful plants and beautiful mountains, the brokenness is still around us. How, how's it going to get fixed? How will the brokenness be remedied? Is there a remedy? That there is. In, in every one of our stories, at least, I, I, maybe not everyone, but most of our stories, most of our good stories, most of our legends, they start off with brokenness or a threat that needs to be taken care of. So, for, for example, the empire is taking over the galaxy. Who's going to stop the stormtroopers and Darth Vader? Sauron has returned to Middle Earth. Who's going to stop him and his orc army? Thanos is coming. Who's going to stop him? King Richard is off at the Crusades. Evil Prince John is ruling in England. Who will stop him? Again, woven into the fabric of so many of our stories and legends is this idea of some kind of crisis, some kind of impossible problem, and, and we need a hero who's going to come in and intervene and fix the brokenness and bring peace, bring wholeness. When, when Isaiah was prophesying, God's people were in such a situation. Things, these, things had not gone well in the life of God's people. Starting all the way back in the garden. Remember when, when Adam, in, in, instead of having been entrusted with the regency of this earth, he, he was meant to govern this earth and rule it well. He, he thought he knew better than God and he and his wife violated God's law. The, the one rule, right? And partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and that brought about a brokenness in the world. And, and ever since then, mankind has been tried, trying to remedy the brokenness. And God has been promising that, that a remedy would come. He, even, even as Adam and Eve fell, the, the, there was a promise given that the seed of the woman would cr come and crush the head of the serpent. And so, so there was a looking for that seed. Who's going to be that seed? So they have Cain and Abel. Maybe, maybe it's Abel, but Cain kills Abel. Maybe it's Noah who God saves in the flood. But even though Noah was very righteous in the beginning, he, his life did not end well. Where's, where's this deliverer going to come from? Where's this redeemer going to come from? Where's the re hero going to come from? Where's this rescuer going to come from? And so God gives a promise to this man named Abraham and says, Abraham, through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to... Uh, your descendants are going to be like the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. Even though Abraham didn't have any descendants. And then God miraculously gives him Isaac. So maybe Isaac's the redeemer, but wait, God says, no, take your beloved son, your only beloved son, Isaac, and sacrifice him to me. And yet God stops him to give us a picture of of another son who would bear wood on his back and go up and be offered as a sacrifice for, for us later on. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Maybe, one, maybe this hero is going to come from one of the 12 sons and that whole family ends up in Egypt. And, but they're, they're going to die because Pharaoh's starting to throw all the male descendants into the water. Where's the hero going to come from now? God raises up a redeemer, Moses, who comes to rescue God's people and take them out of Egypt and bring them into the promised land after they've met with God on Mount Sinai. They come into the promised land, they take possession of it, and yet every man starts doing what's right in their own eyes because there's no king in Israel. And so God, God the people want a king because they, they recognize that 
that lawlessness is throughout the land. And God says, I'm, I'm supposed to be your king, but if you want a king, here, here's Saul. He does not fare well. And so God gives them a king after his own heart, David, who he raises up. Maybe, maybe this is that promised redeemer. And David falls into sin with Bathsheba and murders Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, the wife of the hit. I'm sorry, murders Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, the Hittite. Well, maybe it's David's son, Solomon. But Solomon ends up plundering the nation, plundering the nation, plunging the nation into idolatry so much so that, that the nation is split. So you can imagine, you, you remember here in the United States, we had, we had a civil war where the South wanted to secede. Well, that's kind of went, what went down in Israel, that, except it was the North that seceded. And so what you had is what would be the equivalent, uh, if, if you do the math, in Israel, it was 10 tribes in Israel, two tribes of Judah in the South. So for us, it, it, if it was America, it would have been something like you have eight, eight states left in the South and 41 states in the North. Their nation's divided. And then by the time Isaiah comes around, the northern kingdoms plunge so far into wickedness and idolatry that God sends the Assyrian army to wipe them out. So, so you can imagine, imagine here in the United States, there's been, a, there's been 41 states that have seceded, and then those 41 states are wiped out. No longer. Gone. And the army that wiped out the 41 states is waiting at the gates for the nine remaining states. This is the, this is the kind of situation in which Isaiah is prophesying. And things look hopeless. Things do not look good because he figures, wait, they, they were able to take out 41 states. What chance do our nine states have? They were able to take out 10 tribes. What chance do the tribes of Judah and Benjamin have against the Assyrians? And in the midst of this, Isaiah, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives a prophecy. The prophecy you're all familiar with, but I, 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 I'm hoping this morning that you'll see it in a different light. Isaiah chapter 9, if you're able this morning, we stand for the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on, forever, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. This is God's word. You may be seated. Okay, so I, I, I want us to start thinking a little bit differently. I, I want us to think of, of what it meant to have a monarch in the day and age in which Isaiah was prophesying. Because here in America, okay, what? We're, okay, so 1776, so we're, we're 250 something. Wait, don't. America's old, but we're not that old. And, and, and we're used to a certain <clears throat> cycle in our government. We, we get to vote. We're a democratic republic, right? And so every four years we get to vote. And so we know that if the president in office is really lousy, we, we have hope because he's only going to be there for a few more years. Maximum of eight, and then we get to vote again, and hopefully we can get a better guy in there. And, and so we have this kind of rotating door to the Oval Office. That, that wasn't what things looked like back in Isaiah's day. Kings would serve often for lifetimes. So you'd have a king in office for 40 years, and what do you do if he's a really lousy king and makes stupid decision and, and plunges the nation into all kinds of messes? Those messes are going to be hard for anybody to get out afterwards. But in the midst of 
the messes that Isaiah had seen, first in the northern kingdom, but, but then some of the messes he'd seen taking place within government in the southern kingdom, he gives this promise, a child is born, a son given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it up, holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forevermore. Isaiah and the people knew the brokenness of their nation. They knew the brokenness of humanity. They knew somebody, someone had to fix this. If if there's going to be any hope for them as a nation, as a people, they needed somebody who would come and, and redeem. What kind of redeemer could come and do this? They've had their share of earthly kings and they blew it over and over and over again. So they needed a redeemer, a king of a different order, the the God man. Which brings us to our new city catechism question for today. Question 21, what sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? One who is truly human and also truly God. And this is a prophecy foretelling of a truly human and truly God redeemer who would come. So we're going to talk more about this in the next couple weeks as we look at his humanity and then his d- divinity. But we don't believe Jesus was a really good guy who was so good that he became a man. I'm sorry, who was a really good man who was so good that he became a God. That's not what Christianity teaches. It's what Mormonism teaches, okay? We, we, we don't believe that he was just God who showed up as a man. Kind of like God who, who appeared, kind of like Zeus in ancient mythology used to appear walking around as a man, but he was really God. No, we believe God The eternal God took on finite human flesh and became one of us to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Man had gotten humanity into this problem. Man couldn't get humanity out of this problem, so God became a man to get us out of the broken curse we were under. And so, God becomes flesh. Notice in in this passage, we have in this very same verse, verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 6. A child is born. A son is given. This is the idea that he's going to be human. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. This, I, I, I want us to look at these four different titles for Jesus. And, and I want us to think, think of how Jesus comes as a redeemer, as the perfect God-man, and, and fulfills these. Because here's the thing. Our counsel isn't wonderful. Our counsel is limited because we don't see all perspectives, right? We, we have a very narrow focus of, of the counsel that we can give. And, and so what, here's, let me back up. W- let me ask you this, where do you go for counsel? It, it depends on what you need help with, right? So like this last week, um, I had left, I, I hadn't emptied the, the big coffee urn in the fellowship hall. And if you don't, if you leave coffee in there for like a week, it starts, it doesn't smell right, right? So, so how am I going to clean this? So I pulled out my phone, right? And how do I clean a coffee urn? Da, da, da. And, and it counsels me, take half vinegar, half parts water and percolate it. And it's going to clean it out. And I did it and it worked. Yes. Good counsel from the internet. Does the internet always give you good counsel? Say no, no. Okay. There's all kinds of idiocy. There's all kinds of stuff straight from the pit of hell that you can find on the internet. It does not always give you good counsel. You know the internet wants your money, right? You, you, you realize there, there might be a right answer on the internet, but you may not find it because whoever's paying the tab on Google is getting higher Google rankings so that you'll go to their answer first and they can get your money. I mean, that, that's, that's a big part of it. The, I, I, I hate the way the... The internet's, I, there's great blessing in the internet, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's, there's, there's great problems with it too because historically, when you would have counsel or wisdom, you'd either look in a book like Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that, or, or else you'd, you'd go to somebody who's actually had experience 
Right? The, the, in, in more traditional societies still to this day who aren't as addicted to the internet like we do, and in historical communities, that one of our greatest treasures were our older saints. People who've walked before, right? Who've, who've gone through some of these challenges. And so, so you're having problems in, in your marriage. You, you come to church and you go, you know what? <sighs> Jerry and Linda have been married for a lot of years. Let's go talk to Jerry and Linda. Because they've, they've gone through ups and downs and they've seen God's faithfulness. And, and let's go talk to them. So a young couple would go and talk to Jerry and Linda because God had, had they, they'd, they'd been through it. They'd seen things and, and Jerry and Linda would be able to give wise counsel. Now, Google, I'm having trouble in my marriage. What do I do? You know, I mean, it, it's just, it's nonsense. Don't ask Google those things. Go, 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 to, go to gifts whom God has given you in the church. By the way, that's, that's the picture God gives us of his body. That we are gifts to one another. So, I'm God's gift to you. But guess what? You're God's gift to me. So, so for example, um, speaking of one of the great blessings from the internet, <laughs> Amy came across this thing uh, on the internet where somebody was giving away a bus. And uh, they had bought a bus that they were going to like trick out. And, um, and they'd waited, they'd had it for like two years and they'd never got around to fixing it. And they're like, you know what, it's just taking up space. Let's just donate it to some charitable organization. So they put up a post and Amy saw the post and there were like 40 people who were like vying for this bus. And Amy's like, look, we're just up the street. We can come get it whenever you want. Uh, we'll write you a tax deductible letter. I mean, all this. And sure enough, we got a bus, which you saw in the parking lot when you pulled up this morning. There's a bus out there. It's like a twenty or thirty thousand bus dollar bus that we got for free. It runs on national gas. It needs brakes, but there's another gift to the church by the name of Chad Shaw, who happens to be a mechanic. He can take care of that, right? And so, so, so uh, you, you see that that you're a gift to the church, and and so there's there's this idea that we're we're all um, gifts to one another, and, and that's how we ought to think of each other when we come on Sunday. Maybe, maybe one of the things that, keep, that doesn't keep us at home on Sunday morning watching the Facebook live feed, which is there for you when you're sick or dying, um, <laughs> but one of the reasons that you don't stay at home and come instead is because you remember, oh wait, it's not just because what I get from church, it's what I can give because I'm a gift to the church. And so where do you look for counsel? If, if you need to know how to clean a coffee pot, you can look for it on the internet. Great, stupid phone, now my flashlight went on. Um, if, if you need to know, if, if you need wisdom for life, look, look to some of the saints around you. But, but imagine if you had access to the wisest counselor ever. The, the one who saw the beginning from the end, who, who knows all the perspectives. Because isn't that one of the challenges you have? You, you, you'll have some kind of conflict and, and you'll go to a friend and you'll share the, the conflict you're having and, and, and they'll give you some advice. But... But you've got to remember when you're telling your side of the story, is that's all it is, is it's your side of the story. That, that's the limited information that your friend has. Is they're just hearing your side. They, they don't see the other side. Well, Jesus, in, in being prophesied and called wonderful counselor, this idea of wonderful has, has the connotation of divine or, or supernatural. It's, it's the idea that, that Jesus doesn't need other counselors. Kings from time immemorial, presidents even today, surround themselves with counsel. Jesus doesn't need other counsel. He doesn't need your counsel, even though isn't that funny that sometimes we pray to instruct him how he ought to act and move in our lives. This is, this is not how, <laughs> he, he's in not need of our, our wisdom. And so his counsel, you never need to second guess. You don't need to wonder, is, is he right? He doesn't make mistakes. He gives superlative guidance. He's the one as you, you want as your phone a friend, right? Not just for who wants to be a millionaire, but for the game of life. He's, he's the one you want as your chief advisor who you, who you ought to seek counsel for in everything. See, we, we hear the word counselor, and here's what happens to us. We, um, we adopt the mindset of um, modern day therapists and, and psychologists in, in this sense. They're, they're, 
there's this idea out there, well, if, if things get really bad in, in my life or my marriage, I'll go see uh, a therapist or, or a counselor. And, and then they'll go see a counselor and, and then if I like what the counselor's telling me, I'll do it, right? You know, if, if, if I like it. So it's, it's not the final step. I'm not just, it's not, I'm going to go to the counselor and just do what they say. No, it's, I'm going to go to the counselor and if I like what they're saying, then I'll do it. They're, they're, they're friends who we've gone to and we approach the same way. We, we say, well, um, here's, here's what I'm facing and, and this is the challenge. And, and we love those friends who, and, and we say, this is what I'm thinking about doing. We love those friends who say, yes, that's what you should do. But the friends who, who might love us and, and see, maybe, see, see maybe errors in our judgment and who say, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh my gosh. They must not really be my friend. They think they know it all. We don't like the no answer, right? And, and that's often what happens with us and God. We, we go to God for counsel. We go to, for instruction from him in his word. And that's what I try to instruct from primarily is his word. So I don't have to be the bad guy. I'll let Jesus be the bad guy from his word. Because we don't like the no answer because we want what we want. And, it, and, and if we understand who Jesus is and what he's come to do, Jesus didn't come to make your life not fun. He, 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 didn't, he, he came to bring you joy, to bring you delight, to guide you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, to redeem you. And if you recognize who he is and what he has done and what he knows, when, when he instructs you, even, even if it's not what you had hoped for, you will delight in his instruction. We live in a world in which we're told, do what's right for you. Follow your heart. And, and yet, the Bible doesn't instruct us that way. The Bible says, do what's right. Period. Not for you. Do what's right. Don't follow your heart. The heart is Deceitful above all things. You all know who've lived any length of time how your heart can deceive you. Now, now some of you are saying, but, but pastor, I've tried seeing God's counsel and following his way, and it hasn't worked out. What, what do you mean by hasn't worked out? I, I, I admonish you two things. Make sure you're seeking his counsel the right way. Make sure you're seeing his counsel by by going to his word, by cultivating a healthy prayer life, by spending time with others who've, who've done the same. But when you say it hasn't worked out, I, I, I think when we say that, here's what we think working out looks like. We, we expect prosperity and comfort and health. And yet, is that what God's called us to Always. Does prosperity make you rely on God more? Does health teach you to depend on God more? Does comfort make you yearn to be close to God? And, and so maybe there are times when God doesn't allow these things in our life so that we, he might draw us to himself. Look back on your life. When are the times you grow closest to God? In times of difficulty. Times of affliction, times of hardship. He is the wonderful counselor. Not only is he the, the wonderful counselor, this God man, he, he comes to be a, a mighty God. Now, we don't think of God in these categories because we have guns and we have credit cards. And, and what I mean by that is we have guns and laws and military and police officers to protect us. And we have credit cards to provide for us. Okay? That's, that's, that's our modern realities. And yet in antiquity, tribal people, again, Israel was a, this loose affiliation of all these tribes. They needed a God to protect them because they weren't nearly as big as the Assyrians or the Egyptians or the Babylonians. They needed a mighty God who would stand up for them to watch over them. Back then... It, 
people thought of gods in this way, that gods were tied to the territory. And so there were the gods of the Egyptians and the gods of the Canaanites and the gods of the Assyrians. And, and you can even read it in the Old Testament. In fact, um, yeah, we don't have time. There, there are times when warring armies come to the gates of Jerusalem and say, say, basically, you're going down because our God's stronger than your God. There's a beautiful episode that takes place with King Hezekiah where he, he takes, he, he goes before the Lord and says, hey God, um, they're saying they're, they're stronger than you. <laughs> can you. Can you show them who's boss kind of thing? I mean, that's Pastor Robert's paraphrase, but it's, it's awesome. But it's, this, you know, here you have this little King Hezekiah in this little nation and God shows up in big and powerful supernatural ways and it's awesome. But, but this is what God's trying to convey to you is that he is a mighty God. We, we, again, when we think about God, for so many of us who've grown up here in the United States, we just, we've always thought of God in one category that there's just the God of Israel. There's Yahweh or Jehovah, if you would, the triune God who, who we worship. But back then, there were, there were other gods who were held up as rivals to God. Friends, there, there is no mightier God than the God of Israel. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or think or imagine. And, and again, this might sound a little heebie-jeebie to some of you, especially, you know, we're, we're such materialists and such evidentiary. Uh, um, this might sound weird, but the Bible actually says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness and high places, that there are really supernatural forces at work. But guess what? All of those forces fall under the subjugation of our mighty God, who protects us, who will watch over us. That's why we can send our kids to college. We can send them to Notre Dame or Burbank or LA because there's a mighty God who will watch over them and care for them and who began a good work and will be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. That's why we can send our kids to the mission field because guess what? God is still sovereign in those pagan nations that they're going to. We have a mighty God who not only protects, but he, he provides. Uh, again, in, in the Old Testament, the idea of a God. Um, <laughs> these were agrarian societies where, where people, if you were going to eat, rain had to fall and sun had to shine and the locusts and plagues had to be kept away. Who's going to do that? Minsato or, you know, no. Pesticides, No. God was going to do that. In fact, it's interesting here in the United States, we, they've done polls that show that the more agrarian the society is, the more religious they are. Why? Because farmers recognize they don't grow this stuff. <laughs> they put it in the ground and they pray. God's the one who grows this stuff. You better hope a tornado doesn't come or a hurricane. Maybe God will protect the crops because they're more closely connected. We're not connected to this stuff at all. We go to Ralph's and if they don't have the stuff we want on sale, we go to Albertsons, right? No. This mighty God idea is, is that our Savior is a God who will not only protect but provide and care for us. So this God, man, this Redeemer who's going to come and reverse the curse, who's going to set everything's right, is a wonderful counselor. He's, he knows all that we need. He sees perfectly and clearly. He's a mighty God who will protect and provide for us. He's an everlasting Father. Now, uh, again, a little bit of a paradigm shift for some of you because you'll hear this word everlasting Father and immediately you think the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. But this is, is a title applied to Jesus. And it's applied to him because... In, in this way. So, as our first father, Adam, was what we call the federal head of the human race, so our second father, Jesus, comes to redeem us and be our loving, caring leader. Okay, so um, this idea of everlasting father, again, back in this day and age, a lot of kids didn't grow up to really know their dad because their dads would die when the kids were young. We, we, we see this, you know, this is probably one of the reasons why Joseph is absent in Jesus' life because we think he, he died. And part of the reason is because historically, when you look at the marriages that took place, it, it took a while for 
a, a man to build up enough wealth and, and sustenance to be able to provide for his wife. So oftentimes, guys who were 10 years older would, would marry a, a girl who was 10 years younger. And so this idea of, of an everlasting father would have been foreign to, to the, Isaiah's first readers because fathers die. Fathers don't make it. They don't live forever. And, and they would have seen this as a blessing as opposed to our culture in our day and age where kids grow up just waiting to get away from their father because of the way, because of the way fathers are looked at and fatherhood is portrayed in our modern day media. Fathers seem to be buffoons who don't know what the heck's going on. Mothers are the ones who really know what's going on. But it wasn't that case in antiquity. The, the family structure was centered around the father, who was the provider and leader and guide of the house. And so this idea of an everlasting father in Christ would, would have been precious to them and should be precious to us as well. In our society that's rampant with divorce, we share much of this same longing for fatherhood in common. And to have a father who promised, I'll never leave you, forsake you, would have brought joy to the first readers of the Bible. And so Jesus is called our everlasting father. Now, now for some of you that, again, this is a paradigm shift. And, and it might be hard, especially because maybe if you, some of you had really lousy earthly fathers. And you think, well, another father's the last thing I need? Well, friends, I beg to differ. An everlasting father is what we need the most. A, a leader who will provide for us security and stability and protection and provision and love. Who will watch over us and guide us and care for us. I know it's not on TV anymore. And it probably wouldn't get High Nielsen readings with a title like Father's know, Father Knows Best. But that's the idea that the Bible conveys to us. And that's what we need. See, God knew exactly what we needed as a broken humanity to redeem us. A wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace. Um, and this Prince of Peace comes and gives us peace in, in actually three ways. He brings peace to our broken world. He pre brings peace between us and God and he brings peace to our hearts. So we live in a world that's still not at peace. If you watched the news this last week, you know that. I mean, we, we see what's going on in um, Nigeria. We see what's going on in North and South Korea. We see turmoil. We see conflict. We see what's always been going on in the Middle East, right? A, a lack of peace. And, and you wonder, when's there finally going to be peace? Well, peace will be ultimately realized when the redemption that began at his first advent will be completed at his second advent. When the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he returns in glory. But, but that peace can, can be realized in our hearts, even now through what Christ has done for us. Because he, he comes to bring peace between us and God. Now, now, I was talking to somebody today at the first service. They, we were, they were talking about how they're having difficulty talking to other people about God because the person just says, well, God just loves us. And does God love us? Absolutely. He loves us in the person of his son, Christ. Does God love our self-destructive behavior? Absolutely not. We all have self-destructive behavior. We all sin. We all fall short of God's glory. Um, this is a DVD, a re, uh, DVD-R actually. It's, it's a blank DVD. And I got a few years ago uh, this really cool gadget where you can put in your VHS video recordings and play them. And then you can burn a DVD. Okay, so like our wedding video, I could put in there and play. But what, what happened was, is you'd burn the video on here and then you'd start watching it and 
I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have, have you ever thought and anticipated you'd see one thing on a video recording and you saw something else? Like there, there, there are parts in it where you want to just edit and take out, right? And, and praise God, we have editing software that's really cheap. We can do that now. We can throw the video up and, you know, change the music. That, we, we, can, we can do that kind of stuff. In fact, we, we do that with... with a, we do that with, with our phones, right? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little too excited. We, we do that with our phones. We, we take... Um, we, we, we take pictures. So if, if, if I want to take a picture of the congregation, I'm standing here smiling, I take a picture, then I look at it and I go, ah, you know what? Um, Norma, I, I didn't see your smile. We have to take it again. We, we can edit. We can do over, right? And, and what happens is, oftentimes when we come before God, we want to edit ourselves. We, we, like our first parents, want to ri- run and hide and cover ourselves with fig leaves because we see stuff on here. We see stuff on the videotape or DVD of our lives where we recognize we ought not to have done that and we feel shamed and we feel guilty because we know, we know we've not behaved or acted or thought or loved the way we should. And... And when there's brokenness in a relationship, you can't just ignore it. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm I'm sure anybody who's been in any kind of relationship, whether it be parental or or with a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, you, you get in an argument, right? And then you realize you were wrong. So, so you can do one of two things. You can either just pretend that it never happened, right? Or you can fess up and take ownership of your wrongdoing and ask for forgiveness. What do you think is going to prosper that relationship? Pretending it never happened, shake your head and say no. Okay, if, if you're married and you keep having arguments and pretend they never happened, that's not going to work well. You, you need to remedy it, right? You, there, there needs to be some kind of intervention. There needs to be some kind of sacrifice. You need to at least sacrifice your pride and admit your wrongdoing. And, and that's what Christ calls us to. He calls us to recognize our brokenness. He, he calls us to recognize our sin. He calls us to confess it. And he says, I, I can take care of this. I can make things right between you and God. I I paid the price for your salvation on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago where where I bore the punishment you justly deserved and died to break this curse that's infested all of humanity. I lived a life of perfect righteousness so that if, if you unite yourself through faith in me, God will look upon you as he looks on me, holy and acceptable before him. That's the kind of redeemer we need. And he's the only kind of redeemer who can fix things. A redeemer who's truly God and truly man. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we, um, we come before you thankful, Lord, Thankful for keeping your promise and sending to us a, a wonderful counselor who, who has all the answers and who knows what we need. For sending to us a, a mighty God who will protect and provide for us. For sending to us an everlasting Father who will always be there to lovingly lead us. For sending to us a Prince of Peace who will bring peace to our broken world bring peace between us and you and who brings peace to our hearts. So I I pray he would dwell in our hearts richly by faith. And while we live in a world that tells us that we can redeem ourselves or that there's some other way to redeem, to redemption outside of Christ, Lord, may we trust your word by faith and walk in it so that we can be instruments of that redemption and heralds of it to a world that so desperately needs it. Lord, I I pray for any here this morning who might not yet know you as they ought, who might not yet 
realize their need for a Redeemer and the greatness of the redemption that's already been provided for them if they'll come by faith to it. Would you grant them that gift of faith that they might come to know you and love you and treasure you above all else and find that peace and that love that only you can give. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction this morning? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace as you go in his grace. Have a wonderful Sunday. Um, There's amazing treats in the back. Hope you'll stay and join us for those. And um, we'll see you next Sunday, if not before. God bless.